Welcome to the Development Success Series. In this call, I talk with David Pitts, who's a lawyer, and he worked with a lot of tech startups. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Likewise. David, like, how did you get into law? What's your background? That's a really interesting question. So I'm not like a lot of lawyers. I know a lot of lawyers. They were born with the judge's robes on their body. I get my interest in law started late. I was finishing up some graduate work in economics, and I got a call from my sister who had just started law school down in the States. And she said, Dave, you would really like this. And I said, oh, you think so? And that uh, ticked a, a little um, a light bulb in my brain, and I started thinking about it. And ultimately, my background up to that point had been in math and economics, and that's all about problem solving. Mm -hmm. And the law, all that is the way we solve our problems amongst ourselves. So the law serves to resolve conflicts between everyone. A lot of people don't really think about it that way, but it, ultimately, that's what it is, whether we like it or not. There's a law, there's a legal background to all of our interactions. So if you, the obvious thing is if you break the law, commit a crime or something, the law becomes involved in persecuting that or prosecuting that crime or like not even anything so serious. You want to have your property rezoned so that you can build a shed or something like that. That's when the state interacts with individuals and that's one type of law and then individual on individual. So you know, just even families, uh, sometimes uh, couples, they break up and you, know, you have to go to court to get a divorce. These interactions, these relationships relationships are, are what govern us all and the law working in the background behind it. And my particular area of expertise, business law, has to do with these interactions, these relationships as well. It's about working and interacting with other business people, but you want to be working from a sure footing. So what kind of promises are you getting from customers, your suppliers to be able to rely on? So in business law, enforceable promises or contracts are bread and butter. If I could bring it all back to how I got into law, it's ultimately it spoke to my interest in problem solving. What keeps me coming back is the fact that no two clients' problems are the same. So each time it's working within a similar framework, but also the individual nature of each problem of each client of all of their businesses, is very appealing to me. And uh, yeah, I love what I do. And I'm happy. That makes sense. I think you were also telling me before, there's different types of lawyers that I didn't know about this before. There's a solicitor and litigators. You can give a brief breakdown on them. No, yeah, I would happy to. Yeah. So Broadly speaking, there's, of course, lots of overlap and different people practice different things. But broadly speaking, you can divide all lawyers into two groups, solicitors and litigators. The best way to think about it is solicitors mostly operate on paper and litigators mostly operate in court. A solicitor might be the person drafting your contracts, whereas the litigator might be the, per might be the person arguing to a judge if the person you entered into that contract with breached it. It's a very nuanced distinction, not very nuanced, but it's an interesting distinction because both have their, their positive aspects and their drawbacks. I'm a solicitor myself, so that means I work mostly on paper and I see it as my job to keep you from having to contact a litigator. So by having strong and thorough X, as well as any other relationships you might be getting into with business partners or with regulators in your particular industry, having a strong footing there will keep those relations, those interactions from devolving into a point where you're in a dispute and gotten to the point where one party has said, I am i can't deal with this on my own anymore. I can't get any more headway just by speaking directly to the counterparty. I have to file a lawsuit. I have to go to court. And that's where your litigator would come in. And there's a common phrase in the law world that there are no winners when it comes to litigation, because unfortunately, and it's just a product of the system and the world we live in, but once you're in court, even if you're winning, even if you're the person on the right side, you're spending lots of money, it's taking up lots of your time, and it's going to be a long time before you see a resolution to that. I was dealing with one matter where, unfortunately, the person has to go to court, and they can't get in front of a judge. I heard about this last week, where in September, sorry, October of 2022, the next time they're going to be able to get in front of a judge, and this is just to enforce a contract, is going to be in July of next year. If this is a big contract and you're waiting to get paid, that's a long time. They're solicitors and they're litigators, and I view my job as a solicitor to keep you from having to go to court, because that's the beauty of it. So if you speak with a lawyer, if you have a lawyer look at your contracts, whether it's with your suppliers or your vendors or with your customers, or with even within your organization, between your part, like your business partners, your shareholders, or your employees, if you have a lawyer look at those who's knowledgeable and knows the types of promises that are going to be enforced, the type of ambiguities that can exist, situations that you might not be thinking of now, but ultimately almost always come to pass, if you have a lawyer look at those contracts, you can save so much money in the long run, and that's including paying the lawyer to do this. 
if you have somebody knowledgeable looking at it from a lens of how can we avoid this going to court? And it's, I guess, maybe a little bit of a, what's the word, a, a, a not so nice way of thinking about things. But if it saves you the headache and the heartache in some circumstances in the future, it's good to look at it through that lens right from the get-go. So yeah, solicitor, a good solicitor will save you having to pay for oftentimes a more expensive litigator. And like I said, if you get involved in litigation, it's, there's no winners, even if you're right. And even if you do win. Makes sense. So when should a company engage the lawyer? Should we do it when we get in trouble? Obviously that's what usually happens, but in your opinion, when should we engage? I think it's hard to say, and you're right. Unfortunately, for better or for worse, a lot of the first conversations I have with clients are in the context of a dispute, are in the context of a an otherwise hardworking client of mine having a customer who's not happy for whatever reason. And they're threatening legal action or they're threatening to write a bad review or threatening to start a chargeback procedure like that, or perhaps they already have. And unfortunately, that's usually the first conversation I have with a client is how do we deal with this one problem? And, you know, I don't know when the best time to first speak with a lawyer would be. I know when it's too late, once once you're having a conversation with me where somebody's already upset, I know that's too late. But ultimately, if you're thinking about starting a business, you're putting some money into it, you're putting some time into it, it might be best at that point to to think about, have a five minute conversation if you have a lawyer friend or tap me on the shoulder and say, hey Dave, what do you think about this? Because with a few simple tricks right from the get go, tricks might not be the right word, but a few simple steps from the get-go, you can avoid what ultimately be the, your first pitfall as somebody in a startup, which would be a dispute with a customer that started from not necessarily anything nefarious on your part. So oftentimes the defu- disputes I see, I might be biased here, but all of my clients are hardworking, honest people who want to do their job well, and they want their clients to be satisfied. And what usually happens, a dispute usually arises in two circumstances. One, there's been a bit of an oversight in the engaging that client by saying, perhaps you weren't clear about timelines, about deliverables, about certain expectations that your client may need to have about the work you're doing for them. But oversight in that regard. So not having a fulsome statement of work or contract, a customer contract that's really addressed a a lot of the possible pitfalls, a lot of possible disputes that could arise. That's one way. So just an oversight. And if you speak with somebody like me, seeing the other side of that, where the problems have happened, they can be addressed before they happen. And that can save you a lot of time and a lot of money. And the other side of it is the other dispute that I see arising is just unreasonable clients. Unfortunately, the more work you do, the more chance you have of running into these unreasonable people. And of course, they're zealously advocating for their own business and their own interpretation of the deal you struck up with them. But if you have clear, enforceable contracts that deal with the type of situations that often arise, you can simply point to the contract and say, you know, what you're being unreasonable about thought about this. If this was all to be delivered. You've said you've accepted it. I'm not going to do any more work for you. It's all written right here. When it's not in writing like that, it becomes a lot more difficult to have that even difficult customer or client see your side of the side of the story to see ultimately what was the right side of the story. Yeah. To answer your question, I think as soon as possible, as soon as you start doing business for yourself, or as soon as you start a business, it's a good idea to talk to a lawyer. And that's whether or not you're dealing with one client or thousands of clients, whether or not you're working for yourself, or whether you're thinking about starting an agency with 50 employees and a few shareholders and a few partners here and there. It's good to consult with a lawyer just so that you can start from a a firm footing like that. Okay, that makes sense. What are the types of contracts you've seen so far that most startup companies would need to get in place? I think uh, I think for a lot of tech startups, the most important thing they can do, the most important contract they can have in place is the contract they have with their customers. And that can go by a lot of different names. It can be your master services contract, your master services agreement, a development contract, a customer contract, what have you. It goes by a lot of different names, but ultimately the contract that governs your relationships with your customers as a tech client is the most important for a number of reasons. The first being that each and every tech client I deal with is unique. And if you just pull a, a someone else's master services contract off the internet and start using it as your own, it's not going to be tailored to your business and your business is ultimately different from everyone else's. So 
It's about having a customer contract, the number one unique to the work that you do, because ultimately it is different, but also it provides certain protections. So protections about as what we call scope creep. So making sure that you're, you have a way to identify ahead of time what you're delivering to your client and either have a way to say, no, that's out of scope. We're not going to be doing that for you in a way that's sound or to have a way to expand the project and say, okay, awesome. You want this functionality. That's great. This is our procedure for adding to the timelines and to the price. So to have those, those things taken care of is hugely important. But also in the tech space, we deal with this kind of visceral concept of intellectual property. I'm sure you're very familiar with it, but a lot of people, they get, it's hard to think about in a tangible way because there are a lot of different aspects of intellectual property rights, the rights in copyright and patents and trade secrets and in confidential information. It's about having sound customer contracts that appropriately, number one, grant the rights to your customers that they're paying for. And number one, they're ultimately paying you for some sort of development, but also the ones that don't over deliver. So if you have certain unique processes, processes you're using as a developer, what you want to keep those as your own. You want to make sure that your customers either don't think or don't have a sound legal reason to think that they actually now own that. And that's a big thing that can happen. So between managing the workflow and the actual development and making sure that you're protected against scope creep, making sure you're selling what you want to sell and the customer's buying what they want to buy and there's no ambiguity in between there. And lastly, again, this is all big broad strokes. Lastly, it's just about limiting your liability. So making sure that you're not providing warranties and representations about your deliverables, about the things that you're building for the client that are ridiculous. No code is ever bug free. You're not warranting that it's going to be for a particular purpose because you don't know what that purpose is. Ultimately, that's your client. So you're you're limiting your liability and your warranties in a way that number one, you're still deliver, delivering what your client wants, but you're not promising them the world and not giving them a leg to stand on when the development that you made for them doesn't, it's not transferable from an airplane to a hot air balloon or something like that to use a terrible example. So most important contract would be your customer contracts. From there, it's really about the nature of your business, what kind of contracts you could see quite a bit of benefit from. So it's depending on how you're having um, your work done. Are you, do you have employees or are you dealing just with independent contractors? So for your personnel, what is the right contractual relationship for you? Or I hinted at this before, as between you and your business partners, the ultimate owners of your business, whether you're partners or whether you're joint shareholders in a corporation, what is the relationship between those business owners? And oftentimes we've talked about dis disgruntled customers. Those are bad disputes. But worst disputes are between business owners. So if you have unascertained expectations or your business partners do, then how do you resolve those? So that's another standard contract you would want to take a look at. Just making sure everything's on paper as between you and your business partners, because what's the point of build, building that multi-million dollar business if you don't have a right for anything as between you and your business partners? And then simple things. Being a, a good service provider means that if your clients are worried about confidential information, having a non-disclosure agreement that says, hey, listen, Listen, we can have an introductory call. We can sign this non-disclosure agreement ahead of time and that we won't tell anyone your secrets. Just having those sort of contracts in your back pocket to make sure your customers feel comfortable are great to have. So yeah, those are all essential contracts for any tech startup. And there's going to be other ones along the way. And it's about speaking with a lawyer, a sound, gain sound advice that knows that's dealt with this sort of thing before, because you'll see silly things. I see silly things all the time. So I've seen non-disclosure agreements where there have been non-compete obligations in there. The non-disclosure agreement is supposed to happen at the outset of an engagement. You both agree you're not going to tell each other secrets, but then all of a sudden you've signed up to something to not compete with them for some determined amount of time. So things that are out of scope that perhaps somebody who doesn't look at hundreds of NDAs a year wouldn't necessarily know is it. So yeah, those are typical customer contracts that, you, or sorry, typical contracts that I would recommend a lot of my tech tech clients at least have me take a look at or have on paper prior to really hitting the ground running with their business. And if I can do just a small plug for lawyers generally, it's we talk about lawyers a lot in the context of a dispute. So like I mentioned before, a lot of the first conversations I have with clients is in the context of a dispute. And a lot of what a lawyer can do is minimizing downside. But at the same time, if you look at your contractual relationships through a, a lens of wanting to maximize upside, 
there's also value that lawyers can provide because ultimately we're all in business to accomplish some goal, whether that's building the next Facebook, what have you, or Google, or whether it's just to do something for the next few years and have a business to sell when you want to go and surf on a beach down in the Caribbean. Speaking with a lawyer is a good idea from that perspective because you want to be able to have an asset, your business that you're able to either value and rely on that that value for your own well-being or to sell. And a lawyer is able to have a lot of, er, arrange those assets. And when you're a tech startup, ultimately your assets are the relationships you have with customers and the customers coming in the door and the development enterprise you've built up. If you have a lawyer that's built sound walls around that to make sure those assets are truly yours, that your customers are ultimately bound to pay you and are ultimately not entitled to any part of your business, it's it really does maximize the upside. So I think lawyers can help certainly in disputes, but at the same time, it's about being certain of what's yours and being in a position where if you ever want to sell your business, if you ever want to engage in a round of fundraising from a, from a bank or a venture capitalist or anything like that, about ensuring that from the very get-go, all of your we're in a row and you're going to get the maximum value for your business. So yeah, it's a long-winded way of <laughs> plugging lawyer services, but yeah, it's ultimately those foundational contracts are what number one, minimize disputes and number two, maximize the value of your business. That makes sense. I think you also mentioned to me last time about employee contracts. You shouldn't take a cookie cutter one from your last company. Yeah. I'm happy you brought that up because here in Ontario, Canada, where I used to practice, employment law is one of the most nuanced areas of law that exist. And unfortunately, even a solicitor, somebody who's a solicitor, if they're not even familiar with employment law, they might not even be qualified to draft an employment contract. Mm. Because this is there's some sound justifications for this, but employment law is a situation where, let me take a step back. So I've mentioned a lot enforceable promises before contracts, and there's this general presumption that if I promise that I'm going to give you two jelly beans and you promise me you're going to give me $2, you know, a court's going to enforce that promise. As long as certain aspects were there, we both understand what the deal is. A court, if we if that deal falls apart, we could go to court and have that deal enforced. The same is not always true in employment law. So just because you agree to something with your employee doesn't mean it's enforceable. Just because you have it in the contract and you've both signed it and you've both read it and you've both understood it doesn't mean you could then go to court and expect that promise to be upheld. And that sounds a little strange, but it exists in a familiar way. And the example I always use is, is minimum wage. You and I could come to an agreement where I'm paying you some amount less than minimum wage. That doesn't mean it's legal. That doesn't mean it's enforceable. Mm -hmm. If we both agree to it, if I'm the employer in that situation, I'm going to be stuck paying you back wages for every the difference between minimum wage and what we agreed to, if not some other penalties for having for not meeting minimum and standards in employment legislation. So minimum wage is just one example, but there are all kinds of employment standards that are not well known, are not obvious, and type of things that generally only an employment lawyer or somebody who practices employment law would know. And they can have quite a material impact on your bottom line. The biggest one I can think of is the obligations on termination. I mentioned before, you know, one of the benefits of talking to a lawyer is the lawyer's been there when the relationship breaks down. You're not often thinking about firing an employee when you hire them, but ultimately that's something you should be contemplating in each of your employment contracts. The law says that employees are entitled to a certain amount of notice, a certain amount of severance when they're terminated. And if you try to contract out of that, if you try to give them less severance than what they're entitled to, you can ultimately end up paying much more than what would have been the minimum had you spoken to an employment lawyer. I think with your workforce, and again, this is another hot button, whether your workforce are employees or independent contractors, it's simple things like that, that making sure that number one, your expectation of your workforce is what's actually there. And number two, that you're not going to run into any legal pitfalls that may ultimately really cost your bottom line when you have either a non-performing employee or an employee you'd simply like to part ways with. Or someone thought was an independent contractor that's in the eyes of the law, actually an, an employee. So that makes sense. So as you're talking about this, can any lawyer in Ontario do with any kind of disputes? Or how should they go about choosing that lawyer? If you specialize in tech, there's more advantages of that versus like maybe you talk to a guy who specializes in divorce lawyer. Yeah. So I think there's a few different ways to go about this. And interesting, I think ultimately there's two kind of criteria that you should be looking for when you're looking for a good lawyer. 
Number one is a personal fit. A lawyer, the person who understands my business, somebody that I, I'm comfortable working with who fits into an operation, they might be the best lawyer in terms of their legal knowledge or somewhere in the middle. But if they work well with your organization, with your expectations, with getting done what you want to get done, on a personal level, the lawyer that's right for you. I like all of my clients and I'm lucky. I feel <laughs> maybe that relationship is mutual. But if you don't like working with somebody, don't work with them. The second thing is you obviously, you want a lawyer that's qualified. I operate in this startup tech space. So I'm comfortable with regular routine corporate commercial law and some employment law here and there and a little bit of intellectual property contracting. So all of the, the facets of business that are important for any sort of tech startup. So I'm comfortable practicing those types of law. If somebody were to come to me and say, I want to divorce my husband, I would say, okay, get you in contact with one of my friends because that's not something I'm qualified to do. So yeah, again, it's about finding someone who you're comfortable working with on just a personal relationship is standpoint, as well as somebody who's qualified to do what they're doing. And lawyers are under a professional obligation not to do work they're not qualified to do. That doesn't mean you're not going to find a lawyer who's saying, oh, yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> yeah. uh, so again, always use your judgment. And if something smells fishy, sometimes it is. So yeah, again, personal relationships and qualifications are what you should be looking for. And just like most other, uh, most other people you would retain for any sort of business need. So there's one other contract that I think we didn't touch on a little bit. So let's say I'm starting a startup with my friend and we want to go 50-50 on the, the business. Um, at that point, can they make the article incorporation, just give the shares and that's good enough? Or should they actually find a lawyer at that point? I would always recommend speaking with a lawyer. Of course, I'm a lawyer. Of course, I'm going to say that. No, but the idea is that a lawyer can help in that, if we can go back to the, the divorce context, and this, yeah. this is what I like to think about. A lot of people argue that you should enter into a prenuptial relationship with your future spouse before you get married, only because that's the point where you love each other. You're willing to make sacrifices to agree about what happens if you divorce at that time. And then, you know, when you're mad at each other and ultimately want the relationship to end, that's not, not when you want to be in deciding your entitlements as between each other. So the same can go about a business. You're enthusiastic, you're optimistic, you're, you're gung-ho, ready to start your business with your business partner. You may not be thinking about all the potential pitfalls that could happen. What happens if you disagree? And what are the expectations as between the two of you? Is one of you working 24-7 and the other contributing the startup capital? Is, is there an expectation that if things don't go well, that you'll be contributing more capital in the future? What do you do in terms of dispute? What do you do if one of you wants to bring in a third partner? What do you do if, you know, somebody wants to buy the shares of one, one of the business partners, but not the other? So it's at that stage that I would recommend talking to a lawyer to contemplate those kind of events that, that ultimately always happen. And to make sure that you have a rubric, a structure in place right from the start that governs, at least lays the groundwork for what could happen in those circumstances that ultimately do end up happening. So yeah, it, it's one thing to issue the shares and there's presumptions that go along with that. So if you're both 50-50 shareholders, you're under, there's an expectation that you would be involved in the corporate governance on a 50-50 playing field, which has its own problems too. If there's only two votes and one votes for and one votes against, how do you resolve that? So yeah, it's, it's certainly a circumstance where it's worth speaking with a lawyer or at least writing down from the get-go what your expectations are for third parties' relationships with the business. So whether they're investing in it, whether they're contributing some capital, whether they're an employee who's gaining an equity stake in the business, or what happens in a dispute, what happens if somebody wants to sell their share of the, the company. So yeah, it's worth thinking about that sort of thing right, right from the get-go. And it's, it's one of the things that it's a shame doesn't happen often enough and that's the circumstance when you build a multi-million dollar business and then you disagree with your partner, those can be some of the most acrimonious disputes that happen in the court system. And you've built your multi-million dollar business and then you've spent everything you've earned just to prove a point with your former business partner. It's a shame, but it happens all too often. Makes sense. And then one of the last questions I have was, you told me that sometimes just a lawyer's letter is enough to solve most problems. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, actually, if I... I'm not sure I can elaborate it on all that much, but I can tell you what my experience is. So like I mentioned before, I'm a solicitor. I don't go to court. I'm not a litigator, but I have found, and this has surprised me each time it, it works, is that when you do have a dispute, sometimes it can be as simple as tapping my shoulder and say, Dave, send this letter. I don't want to pay this person, or I want this person to pay me, or what they're saying is not true. I want them to take down bad review, things like that, disputes like that. I yell, send emails, get angry till you're blue in the face. 
And But sometimes all it takes is a letter from a lawyer on a lawyer's letterhead to let the person you're having the dispute with know that you're serious and really get results. I can't elaborate on why it works, but mm. sometimes it just communicates that you're serious, that there are repercussions, and you've taken a step back and you're letting a professional deal with it. And perhaps that's why it seems to work. But yeah, sometimes before you start a lawsuit, it can be just as simple as having a, a lawyer send a letter to solve all your problems. Well, thanks, Dave, for today's call. And if you want to reach out to you for more support, where should they go? So the best thing they can do is send me an email at david at pittsprolaw.com or you can check out my website at pittsprolaw.com. For more information on how to put technology to work in your business, please subscribe to this channel.